Hey, Kamal, how are you? I'm, I'm well, Jawad. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Good to see you. Good to see you too, bro. Uh, well done. Uh, such a great platform you have created. So you deserve all the applause. It's, it's, it's and our great. platform, so, we we all working. We we all working towards it, mate. You know, it's, it's, it is it is truly ours. You know, it's, look, it couldn't have happened with one man. So you you know that, isn't it? You know, it's, we we all working towards it. But it's it's great. Yes. It's, it's absolutely fantastic. I bridge. I love your uh, background. Uh, no, I, I I've not chosen it. I don't know what happened there. <laughs> hey, bridge, how are you? Hi, hi, Jamal. I'm very well. How are you? I'm very well. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Uh, yeah, no, yeah, really. Uh, I think Adam is there. Hi, Adam, hello. Hello, Adam. Hi, Adam. Adam nice me, and, me and you are on the same planet, or? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> yeah. So, Adam, Hi, Adam. I'm, I was going to say, Adam, I've made you the host. Okay, great. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, so can you, you hear me? You can hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Great. Yeah. Um, so I'll unmute myself and uh, I think Javed then emailed us and, you know, it's, it's your show. So me and Kamal will just be um, listening you know, we, and observing. We, we, we're here for tweeting, Bridge. I, I've decided my, my role is to tweet. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm attending students, gastric cancer and everything. My only role is to tweet and understand. And, and, and if, I, if I can learn something, that's even better. Yeah, no, no, I'm sure. I'm sure we will. It sounds like an exciting program. And I think... Hannah Tween is already here, Adam, one of these speakers. Yeah. Hello, Hannah. Hello, Hannah. Hello, Hannah. I think Hannah's one of the panelists, isn't she? Yeah, she's one of the panelists. And yeah. Hannah, you on mute. Sorry. I said, don't cry to me. I'm sure it's not me today. No, no, not. sorry, sorry. I, yeah, <laughs> I, meant, I meant one of the panelists. Yeah. Good, good. Um, thank you. Yeah. No, no, thank you. Thanks, Hannah. I'm nice sure you have, you. we have already planned one for you in October, haven't we? So, yes, we have. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Javad has put on a good program for, uh, it'll be is good. Trial run for Hannah, then, is it? Sorry? So this is a trial run for you, Hannah, then, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, yeah okay, then. That's um, and um, Adam, I'm already, so last time I forgot to record the meeting. So this time I already pre selected the option. So it is already being recorded. And then we will, uh, you know, you can inform all the members who as they, when you start, and we will then uh, aim to put it on the uh, Tug's YouTube channel. So whosoever okay. cannot attend, yeah. Yeah. That's great. That's great. Yeah. No, thank you. Uh, for people to, to, up, to do their presentation, do I make them a co-host? Yes. Works? Yeah. That works quite nicely. If you make them a co-host, yeah. um, then they'll be able to share their screen. Great. Yeah. Excellent. I think I should send them a message to come on board because we uh, probably should do a trial run, shouldn't we? Uh, yeah, that's a good idea. I can see Stein is here. Hello. Hello. Hey, how are you? Stein? Thank you. Hello. Hello. Nice to see outside Twitter, Stein. I, 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 I wasn't <laughs> sure if you existed outside as well. <laughs> So I have messaged uh, Trish and uh, Deep. So they have not come back. Um, Trish has not even read her message. That's a bit worrying. So uh, I'm just like thinking we have uh, five minutes and what if they are unable to join? Um, that's a good question. I never thought of that uh, because it is five minutes left and uh, um, um, Javed, both of them uh, send me an email uh, today itself, and I hope yes. they're all planning to join, unless they get stuck in an emergency. Yes. That's different. So but, do we have a backup um, plan? 
So let me just have a quick look in the computer. Uh -huh. If there's a backup HPB talk that I, I might have, just in case. Yeah. Gosh, never thought of. Uh, okay, if there's a, if they are stuck. Yeah, I can present something. I'm sure they will be fine. Uh, I'm sure they'll be fine. <laughs> Yeah, present something. Sure, no problem. What a plan. If they are not, not able to join, we'll present something. Uh, Trish is here. Hello, Trish. Oh, that's good. Hi there. Uh, hi, doing? Trish. Hello. And and Robin is here as well. Hi, Trish. Yeah. Hi. I think Siobhan has just joined in from some lovely yes. locations. Siobhan, yeah. is that? Uh... Hello, Siobhan. Hello. You're, you're on mute, Siobhan. Hi, everybody. Good evening. Good morning. Whatever the time is. Good evening. Hello, Safan. Hello. Nice Hi, Safan. Hi, Kamal. How are you? Hi, everybody. Yeah, I'm going to go in background very quickly, uh, Safan, and, and, and leave it to SPV team. I'm here for tweeting, you know. That's, that's, my, that's, that's my only purpose. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Mazamba, good to see you. Uh, <laughs> it's been a long time. When yeah. I, I was, you know, I was your trainee. When was that? Two thousand and seven. Yeah. No. You, yes. Right. I still remember. I still remember <laughs> Ron teaching you uh, what's called laparoscopic uh, hernia repair. Then commenting that actually he thought he was going to teach you, and you taught him. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that very. Yeah, I remember like 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 yesterday. My goodness. Yeah, so yeah, gosh, fourteen years ago, unbelievable. I know. Time flies. Time flies. Yes. Is FT still working? FT is working and kicking absolutely, kicking everybody's backside without any. <laughs> so he's, not, he's not here. I'm sure he's not here. <laughs> I'm just making sure. <laughs> oh, dear. FT is, is fantastic. True. So now you know why I bend the tip of the diathermy needle. <laughs> He's a really gifted surgeon, really an asset for, for the unit. Mm. I can't see Deep Mal there online anywhere. Yeah. I'm counting on Deep being here. <laughs> it's going to be a long chat. We have a plan. I'm sure. I'm sure he'll be here. I think, as I said, he, he did um, send me an email. I think it was yesterday. So hopefully he will be here. Um, you're right, I can't see him yet. Uh, Deep is logging in, so we are all good. Excellent. So Adam, over to you. Okay, yeah, shall we start? 
it's, it's almost eight o'clock. Uh, so uh, yeah, welcome everybody to this Tugs Lounge meeting, the Upper GI Surgeons Lounge meeting. Thank you to um, Mr. Rich Modhak and, uh, and Jared Ahmed for organizing this uh, and getting us all together for this meeting. Uh, we've got this meeting on the modern management of pancreatic cancer. This is the first part, there's a second part later in the year. Um, we've got some great panelists and one speaker so far. Um, so we have on the panel, my co-moderator, Siobhan McKay, who um, is a, a senior HPB trainee, surgical trainee at Stoke Hospital, as well as being an academic clinical lecturer at the University of Birmingham, past president of the Rue Group, and uh, you know, very collaborative with her research. Then we have uh, on the on the panel, we've also got Stein Van Lahaver in uh, Bristol, Mr. Jared Ahmed, a consultant HPB surgeon at the University of in, in Coventry and Dr. Hannah Tween, a consultant clinical oncologist at the University Hospital Coventry as well. So I'm just looking to see if we have our second speaker. I can't see Mr. Deep. Oh yeah, we have, we have Mr. Deep Malde as well. So, so if uh, Stein, if you could uh, uh, introduce Trish for us and Trish, I made you a co-host so you can upload your presentation. Please. Okay, how do I do that? <laughs> right. Thanks, Adam. Well, I'll, um, whilst you uh, upload your presentation, Chris, I'll try to introduce you. We've never met, but um, we've got a bit of a connection because you've been a fellow in Bristol before your consultant post in Cardiff, I believe. And uh, um, uh, Andy Strickland can't stop talking about you. Uh, well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, you've got an interesting talk today, and I think it's, um, um, well, I quite uh, find it quite interesting subjects, both uh, prehabilitation and uh, arrows pathway, and I think they're very important uh, subjects uh, in all surgical abdominal patients, but uh, especially in patients uh, undergoing, uh, undergoing major pancreatic surgery. So we're very interested to, uh, to hear from you what sort of the latest things are on those both fields. So uh, okay. I'll, I'll give you the floor. Thank you so much. Um, I am going to just see, I'm not sure whether just sharing my screen will work or do I have to do something else as well? And that's it. Okay, give me one second. I'm going to just pull this up. And so whilst uh, Trish is doing that, what I thought we could do is um, after each presentation, uh, we could maybe take some questions from the audience. Siobhan, if you're there. Uh, if Tron's going to keep an eye on any uh, questions coming on the chat box, so if the audience would like to, to ask any questions, and then the panel could answer some of those questions after the, each talk. Um, Siobhan, do you want to introduce Deep whilst we're waiting for Trish to upload her presentation? Can you hear me? Yeah. Excellent. Sorry, I had a little bit of a technical issue at the beginning. So um, it's an absolute pleasure to be able to um, be here with Adam um, to moderate these fantastic panel and speakers today. And um, I'd like to introduce Deep Maldi, who um, trained in Manchester, but then moved slightly um, south down to um, Leicester, um, who's a consultant HPB surgeon there, and who'll be giving an excellent talk after Trish and also a panel discussion. Okay. I'm not sure if anyone can see my presentation. Not yet. Okay, not happening. <laughs> Give me a second. Um, Have you shared your screen there? Yeah, I think so. Oh, hang on. I've just spotted something. Okay, let's try again. I should have warned you that I'm not very technically savvy. Um, I've got share screen. Uh, if you open your presentation in the background mm -hmm. and then click on share screen. Yeah. And just click on the presentation tab. Yeah, I've done that. 
Okay. So uh, why don't we ask Deep to present uh, his talk? And sure. while I can talk to you on the phone, Krish, and see if I can help you in the background. Yeah, perfect. How about that? Deep, are you happy with that? I'm as ready as I can be, no problem. Trish, are you okay? <laughs> yeah, sorry. Uh, let me see if I can, uh, I can share. Deep, thanks for your help, really appreciate it. Uh, it's all right. Can you guys see my screen? Mm. Yeah. Good, all right. Hi, so uh, my name's uh, Deep Malde. Uh, like Siobhan said, that uh, I'm a, I've been an HPV surgeon at uh, Leicester for about a decade. I trained in Manchester. I spent some time doing transplant in Leeds uh, and Cambridge uh, before I came down to Leicester. Um, I must say, before I applied for the job in Leicester, I didn't know they did HPV, but either way, moving on. Um, so the whole point today is to talk about fast track pancreatic cancer surgery. So, um, so how do we fast track it? This is pretty much the logo we have in, in, in our group uh, WhatsApp, in our WhatsApp group for fast track pancreatic cancer. It's pretty much stuck. So uh, what I'm going to do today is I'll, um, you know, I'm, I'm sure that not all of you are uh, HPV oriented, but I'll just talk briefly about the incident survival, why, why, um, why curative surgery is important. I'll talk about a few changes in practice with vascular resections and neoadjuvant chemo, uh, very brief. And obviously the whole focus of today's uh, talk uh, is gonna be about fast track uh, pancreatic cancer surgery. So, you know, a bit, a bit of data, a bit of background, building the case as to why, you know, we're moving towards fast track pancreatic. Because at the end of the day, uh, as, as the definition says, it's, you know, the whole point is to try to get pancreatic cancer surgery done sooner rather than later. So we'll talk a few, uh, a bit about some pathways that um, I think uh, Keith set up in Birmingham and then we followed up uh, uh, in, uh, in, in Leicester uh, about the logistical issues that we had uh, and how the pandemic scuppered it all. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll talk briefly about how we set the service up uh, in Leicester and, uh, and what challenges we faced. Uh, and obviously we'll take questions uh, uh, at the end uh, if that's okay. Um, so uh, pancreatic cancer incidence, uh, most recent 19 per 100,000 when you compare it to breast cancer, that's 200 per 100,000. Uh, that's why they're more breast surgeons than HPV surgeons. Uh, but it pretty much tells you uh, that the incidence isn't that high. But uh, it's the 10th most common cancer in the UK. It accounts for nearly 3% of all new cancer cases. Uh, the incidence is supposed to increase uh, by a further 6% uh, to 21 by about 2035. Uh, pancreatic cancer is uh, the sixth most common cause of cancer death in the UK. And I remember 20 years ago, we used to talk about pancreatic cancer survival and you know, nothing much has changed now. Uh, pancreatic cancer survival in the UK hasn't changed. So pancreatic cancer is pretty much the deadliest common cancer with the lowest survival. So the one-year survival in England is only 23.7% and the five-year survival is 6.9%. Uh, this Pancreatic Cancer UK uh, uh, graph just tells you uh, uh, how bad uh, we are. So pretty much uh, the curative surgery for pancreatic cancer is pretty much either Whipple's or a distal pank or a total pank. Uh, not very interesting. It's just the three things we do as, when it comes to pancreatic surgery. What makes pancreatic uh, uh, cancer unresectable? It's local invasion, um, uh, be that vascular or uh, uh, distant metastasis, and obviously uh, patient fitness. So I've just taken a few slides off from a talk I've given recently to a, a group of uh, clinicians who are not surgeons, and we were just talking about pancreatic surgery, what's changed. So, you know, the survival hasn't so there have been some changes in practice some uh, some innovations some uh, some future advances the whole point of doing everything that we're doing is to try to shift the goalposts now i'm not sure when when you're when you're you know when we were trainees we used to always tell our patients that you know out of every 100 pancreatic cancers that present to us only 15 percent are resectable 85 percent unfortunately present to us uh, at a point where they're uh, unresectables 
So how do we make, uh, you know, pretty much the unresectable resectable? Or uh, from a surgical side, I would say, you know, how do I make the cancer smaller or how do I make my surgery uh, better? So, you know, building the case for fast track pancreatic cancer surgery. This Dutch RCT pretty much, you know, was a seminal paper over a decade ago, which I'm sure most HPV surgeons would know because uh, it was talked about a lot then. Um, it pretty much said, uh, you know, concluded that routine pre-op biliary drainage in patients undergoing surgery for cancer of the head of pancreas increases the rate of complications. And that means, you know, whether it be an external biliary drain or ERCP, um, Okay, so, you know, um, I remember about 20 years ago, I used to, when I worked in Manchester with Prof. Sirudina, and he just published a, a meta-analysis of portal vein resection. And pretty much the, the conclusion there was that portal vein resection is not, uh, you know, um, advised because of increased mortality, morbidity, and had no survival benefit. Now, that was about 20 years ago. A lot of things have changed since. Uh, there were a lot of... Uh, better portal vein resections happened. Uh, we've had a few meta-analyses and RCTs, as, as shown here, including the one uh, by the UK Vascular Resection uh, uh, Group. And this pretty much shows that, you know, if a surgeon can perform venous resection and reconstruction, there is really no major barrier to performing upfront surgery for those with, you know, a BRPC pretty much means borderline resectable pancreatic cancer and, uh, and, and venous when it comes to venous disease. But when it comes to arterial involvement, I know upfront resection has failed to achieve acceptance as a standard approach, uh, pretty much because of high levels of mortality and morbidity uh, with associated arterial uh, resection. And also uh, among survivors, there does not appear to be any, any real survival benefit uh, when you compare those with resectable uh, disease. Then obviously we've got the neoadjuvant Folferinox. I've never done so many post neoadjuvant uh, Whipples uh, ever since Folferinox started. You know, pretty much from doing like, you know, one every two years, doing like about five, six, seven uh, a year. Um, and there's Precision Pank, you know, up in Glasgow. Um, we are sending some tissue to them as well, where they're looking at the tumor biology and looking at the best chemotherapy for the, like four uh, different pancreatic cancer tumor biology uh, uh, cells that they've picked up. So this is gonna go on for a while. And this pretty much, there's no doubt that the next big step for pancreatic cancer is going to be good chemotherapy. Uh, but uh, there are caveats to everything. When you look at neoadjuvant chemotherapy, you now some patients progress on chemotherapy. Uh, others suffer major complications uh, from having chemotherapy, which may make them uh, you know, not really fit enough to have surgery. And obviously there is the elderly group of patients who were unable to um, be offered uh, the elective, uh, the complete elective uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy. So this is a paper from Cell. Uh, it's quite depressing. If you're an HPV surgeon, I advise you not to read it. Uh, but if you aren't, it pretty much says that you know, when it's been estimated that at presentation, pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma um, pretty much harbors cells that are metastasis that enable. So when a patient presents to you and becomes symptomatic at that time, they pretty much have cells. So they pretty much think that almost all, if not, not all tumors uh, will have some uh, level of metastasis if it's pancreatic cancer. Uh, this is another paper from surgery about a, uh, just under a decade ago, which says that the occurrence of metastatic disease has been demonstrated to be strongly associated with the interval between imaging and surgery. So it pretty much says that uh, the time between imaging and surgery uh, means you're going to have more metastatic disease. You know, that's logic. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's not uh, news, but, you know, that's uh, proven. Uh, and the recent study... Um, I think this is from John Hopkins, uh, pretty much says that it identified the need to repeat imaging after 25 days without surgery due to the rapid appearance of metastatic disease in this short time period. So what everything tells us is that, you know, uh, indirectly uh, telling us that the sooner you do the surgery, you know, the better, uh, the better things will be. So uh, I remember talking to Keith when he published his paper in 2017. I'm not sure whether, uh, I think this was at the time when we started our uh, Midlands HPV meeting when he did his first presentation um, 
on, on fast track pancreatic cancer surgery. I think they started doing stuff in 2015, but they pretty much had enough data about two, two years later to do, uh, to do a publication. So um, this kind of tells you what their pathway was at, at that time. Uh, things have been modified a bit since. Um, so what they said was from referral, pretty much uh, you have a CT and if they're suitable for fast track pathway, then you know um, they pretty much get uh, an MDT discussion. They're seen in clinic pretty much within 24 hours uh, uh, and uh, they get surgery. The, the few things that you note that are uh, not common uh, is that they have a shot, uh, they have an IV infusion of vitamin K, I think it's 10, uh, 10 grams just the day uh, before surgery. So they admitted the day before surgery. And the whole aim was to try to get uh, a patient from the CT to surgery within, uh, within two weeks. Um, their inclusion exclusion criteria was, uh, you know, bilirubin at the time of surgery, they went for it being less than 450, they would accept it. Uh, interesting, so the rates of uh, rise in bilirubin in patients with uh, pancreatic cancer is about 100 uh, a week. So if they found a patient who had about a bilirubin about 350, they tried to get to surgery within a week rather than two weeks. So, um, but they, there was no arbitrary cutoff. Uh, there was, uh, it wasn't a significant uh, factor when you looked at complications uh, or mortality, uh, but their cutoff was about 450. Uh, they, if there was complete occlusion of the SMV portal vein, uh, then they did, did not go uh, straight um, in, on the fast track pathway. Uh, if there was arterial involvement, they didn't. Uh, if they were septic or they had renal dysfunction, uh, they didn't, and obviously, uh, the patient's fitness was uh, was a big um, uh, issue as well. Uh, they pretty much showed. I'm sorry that the the curves are a bit uh, a bit small, but it pretty much showed that one. Um, if you had, uh, if you look at the right top thing, that if you had no surgery, obviously your mortality was uh, you know high. Your survival was poor. If you had no uh, drain, no biliary drainage. Uh, and surgery, uh, it was very equal outcome to if you had biliary drainage and surgery. That's interesting, but you have to look at this on an intention to treat basis, not just so you're looking at everyone who comes to you. And what they showed was that if you look at all comers uh, to the department, then the resection rate um, for pancreatic cancer was nearly 95%, 91, 95% of patients were resected compared to only two thirds uh, in, the, in the drained uh, group. So I think that was the key thing, but that's when you look at it from an all commerce thing. So what they showed was that if you wait 21 days for surgery, 15% of cases are potentially operable will no longer be operable. Uh, this rises to 20% when patients wait for more than 40 days and reduction of waiting time uh, to 16 days increase the resectability by 22%. So like a fifth, um, uh, so that's interesting. So this led us to, uh, in, in Leicester, we looked at, uh, I'll just give you a brief thing about how we set up our pathway and how it's evolved. So I'm um, just looking at the time, so we've got about five more minutes. So, uh, so we had, uh, we looked at our, our pathway, our treatment pathway. Now we looked at the presentation and you know, how patients present to us, what, what things do we involve in, in our diagnosis staging, you know, the CT, MRI, PET, uh, US, as you probably know, that NICE guidelines pretty much say that a PET CT should be done uh, for all, all pancreatic uh, head of pancreas cancers to look for micrometastasis. Uh, a lot of sensors do routine MRI livers. Uh, some don't um, to look for uh, liver mats. Um, endoscopic ultrasound scan is not a routine thing for staging. Staging lab is pretty much out. The only evidence is if you have a tumor more than four centimeters in size, then there is evidence that staging lamp would help. Um, and then obviously there is a pre-op treatment, you know, uh, whether patients have biliary drainage, whether they need feeding, uh, see a dietitian, you know, cancer specialist, give them the information, uh, uh, chemotherapy or radiotherapy nutrient or an anesthetic review or a CPEX text, depending on, uh, on what your uh, anesthetic assessment involves. And then obviously then surgery. So that's your pathway. And how do you make it more efficient and, and shorter? The more steps you have in it, the longer it's going to be. So uh, 
So we, we, we looked at the snapshot. This was a three month snapshot in Leicester when we just three years ago, we looked at you know, what happens to our patients when they present with pancreatic cancer. So it pretty much showed us that you know, the duration from CT scan to first clinical review was about, 12, uh, about 18 days median. Uh, and from clinic review to surgery was 51 median days, you know, uh, and this might sound a lot, but I, I looked at the data from uh, Mayo and Karolinska before they started doing fast track, there was about 60 days as well. So um, about 19 or just uh, or 50 percent had pre obituary drainage, uh, about a third uh, went ahead and had successful uh, resection, 33 attempted. So not great. So we set up a pancreatic cancer kind of uh, expedited. We call it the expedited pancreatic cancer pathway, but it pretty much you know, was we're trying to fast track patients across uh, and is pretty much trying to see what needed doing. Uh, if you look at the pathway on the left, which is the, uh, on the green at the bottom, those are the ones patients who are suitable. You know, we tried to get them, uh, if they're inpatients, to get them CNS review, MDT discussion, dietitian review, anesthetic review, everything while they're here and give them a provisional date for surgery before they went home uh, and came back for surgery. Or if they stayed in, you know, they obviously got it all while they were there. Uh, and obviously there is uh, the patients who obviously didn't meet uh, the criteria that we'd selected. And we looked at you know, the need for biliary drainage, meaning if patients have biliary sepsis were unwell. Uh, at that time, when we set it up three years ago, um, we were like, if they need further tests, you know, if tumor wasn't confirmed in the EUS uh, or a PET at that time, uh, um, then we say, look, you know, maybe we, sh you know, we shouldn't, we should take them off the path. But this obviously has changed now. We get pets in the US is within 24, within about 48 hours. We get inpatient pet scans, we get MRI scans within 24 hours. So a lot, a lot of things have changed. When if you want to get a fast track, then we, we you know, uh, things have improved a lot since. Uh, if they needed a CPEX test, you know, if they had complex, you know, uh, background, uh, and obviously if it's a patient choice. But one thing we could pretty much realize is that we needed a dedicated pathway nurse because without somebody coordinating everything, uh, it just fell apart very easily. Uh, I think when I talked to Keith, it was the same thing. So then he did a cost analysis, which showed that for every patient that you don't do an, a, a pre-op preoperative biliary drainage on, uh, you save about 2,500 pounds. So, you know, if you're going to fast track about 60, 70 patients uh, uh, a year, then you can easily, you know, the cost savings kind of make up for uh, the cost of, of a dedicated uh, pathway person. We now, uh, we didn't have one, we, we struggled. We now have an advanced nurse practitioner and part of his role is to keep the fast track pathway, uh, pathway running efficiently and it, it's never run better. So, um, Finally, this uh, is, is a paper, this is from Karolinska and Mayo. This is a big RCT that pretty much stated that, you know, operation within 32 days of diagnostic imaging reduced the risk of tumor progression in nearly half compared with a longer waiting time. You know, just tells you that trying to get to surgery sooner uh, does help. There's, there's a question as to, you know, a bias in the Birmingham paper as to whether, you know, uh, because they went to the fast track, you know, the 93% resection rate. Uh, but this was, this was an RCT by uh, uh, a big, a big study, and it pretty much showed that the same thing, that the resectability rate increased. Um, so what challenges did we face? Like I mentioned, a dedicated path for nurse was, was, was a challenge to start with. We are lucky that we've got somebody in place now. Uh, there are obviously the local uh, caveats like, you know, your... Uh, your ability to, you know, um, you know, there is a historic thing when I, when we joined, everyone was getting a staging laparoscopy and now uh, pretty much only about 10% get staging laparoscopy. Uh, so things have changed, uh, but there are things that are built into units that don't allow for an efficient pathway. Uh, then there is a dedicated theater capacity. You know, we are pretty much uh, chock-a-block, you know, trying to get our cancers done. And now we have to have a dedicated Base. So we actually had to use a Saturday. So we ring fence uh, a Saturday uh, uh, every other week for a fast track pancreatic cancer. Um, uh, um, we had to get buying from imaging in the US, but we do. So getting MRI, liver, PET scans, uh, inpatient PET scans, endoscopic ultrasound scan. We do about a thousand endoscopic ultrasound scans with, with a list every day. So 
Um, things have improved significantly, so getting those is not a problem. Uh, unfortunately, over the last year, the pandemic scuppered uh, all our fast track pathway. Uh, during the first wave, um, we were pretty good. We didn't even need a fast track pathway because in Leicester, uh, we have three hospitals and our hospital where we do HPV surgery was the clean hospital. So we were operating nonstop. In fact, we pretty much cleared our entire waiting list. We had nobody waiting. There were times when we didn't have patients to operate on because uh, we were doing about two, three cancers a day. And then the second wave hit us. And as you probably know, Leicester's never left the lock lockdown. So we pretty much lost all theater operating capacity in all three hospitals. So our waiting list pretty much went up significantly uh, uh, and nothing got fast tracked uh, anywhere. Uh, we had in fact had to send patients off to Nottingham uh, uh, and Coventry just to be able to um, get, uh, uh, you know, uh, get them done. So yes, we are emerging from that uh, and hopefully uh, everything should be okay going forward. So. Um, the biggest challenge really, uh, and this is the final slide and statement is pretty much is changing people's mindset in that as, as, as an HPV surgeon, I feel that pancreatic cancer surgery uh, should be treated as an emergency. Uh, it's not something that you see in clinic and say, okay, I'll do a PET scan and MDT and stuff, you know. Uh, you treat this as an emergency uh, and then, uh, uh, and I think that's pretty much it for me. That's, uh, thank you, thank you for listening. I will mute myself. Thanks, Dee. Thanks for that, that great presentation. Um, I don't think there's, are there any questions on the chat box? I haven't seen any questions from the audience, but um, do the panelists want to make any comments? Um, yeah, hi, it's Stan here. Uh, <laughs> thanks, Dee, for a nice uh, presentation. And um, I like your way you've uh, set up your pathway uh, in Leicester. It's really impressive. Um, it's a shame the pandemic is uh, been so difficult for everybody because in Bristol we have not really been able to do a lot of fast track workers over the last year. Um, one thing I uh, was wondering about what your thoughts were about um, um, about tumor biology really and obviously um, I understand you're, uh, you're going to a mindset of uh, pancreatic surgery should be an emergency but there's also a, a, there's also a mindset of people thinking that we should give more neoadjuvant chemo um, and obviously people will progress to uh, <coughs> unresectable disease if you don't operate on fast enough but Maybe these are actually the patients who would have always had a, had a, a poor, a poor outcome. Uh, and how do you sort of rhyme um, fast track whipples with sort of the move to neoadjuvant chemotherapy? So I, so I completely agree. I, I, I'm a firm believer that one thing that's going to change everything is going to be neoadjuvant chemo. Uh, the only problem is it's not there yet. Um, you know, I, I think precision pank is great. I think it'll come up with some good results. Hopefully that might help. Uh, and I believe that, uh, but you, you, you've got to understand that at, at the moment, uh, we, it's, so I, I have this thing with Keith, me and Keith always fighting everyone else saying like, you know, everyone says neoadjuvant chemo and we say, look, surgery first. And we pretty much believe in neoadjuvant chemo, but it's not, it's not a recognized pathway yet. Now, I remember I used to work with Andy Smith in, in, uh, in Leeds, and we used to resect everything that walked through the door, uh, as long as, you know, it was resectable. And now he gives everyone neoadjuvant chemo. I mean, this is a guy who has had a complete change in a mindset. And I think it's, it's, it's absolutely fine. But the problem I think with what, what I have, and I agree with Keith, is that the people who become unresectable on chemo, the elderly people, the people who can't have chemo, because chemo, you know, you know, is not without side effects. Uh, I mean, what is the successful rate of adjuvant chemo when you have it with pulse? It's not, you know, a lot of people never get to chemo. So I think, when chemo comes, that's great. You know, we are all for it. But till then, I think we should do the best we can. Uh, and the surgeons, you know, uh, I'm not an oncologist, Stein, so you know where my where my uh, where my eggs lie. <laughs> so, but but I completely agree. You know, I think neoadjuvant is going to be the way forward. You know, um, there's no doubt. But we're not there yet, I'm afraid. Uh, Thank you. We have a couple of questions from the group chat, so I can quickly ask you, Deep, if, if that's okay. So, uh, very uh, brief reply. Why pancreatic cancer metastasis is rate is so high and faster as compared to the other cancers? So as, as you said, and, and there's a lot of evidence that we we people have done research at the time of resection, they have taken portal venous blood and they have found cancer cells in the portal venous blood at the time of resection. So uh, and such a small tumor, like one centimeter, half centimeter pancreatic adenocarcinoma causes so much cachexia uh, and causes so much trouble. Why is that? 
I mean, I, I, I think all of all of us who've operated, you, you have these uh, small tumors, you do it like a T1, N0, R0 resection, and then six months later, they get met. Now, it's not all of them, but they do. So there definitely is a tumor biology thing, which is why I think, so I, I, while I'm not a biologist, uh, I've had a good read yesterday of the paper in, uh, in Cell. It gives a very detailed, inter it pretty much tells you that when a patient presents with pancreatic cancer, the cells, the, tumor, the cell biology of the tumor cells is such that they're actually ready to metastasize. So pretty much they, if you read the paper, it tells you that 99% of patients who present to you have already got cells beyond the pancreas. It's, it's, just, uh, it's just bad tumor, tumor biology. But if you look at uh, you know, the precision pan uh, pilot data, it tells you that there is a division, you know, and that there are tumors which don't behave that way, and there are ones that do ag are aggressive. But okay. uh, two, two, more, two more quick questions. One is: Is there any screening test for pancreatic cancer? Any screening test for pancreatic cancer? Is it from the from the audience? That's like an eternal question. Every GP asks me every time we do a GP talk, but <laughs> unfortunately. There is no screening test for pancreatic cancer. I, I, I hope you all agree uh, that there is nothing we can do. Uh, CA99 is not really a, 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 a right screening tool. The gold standard you know, is, is a CT scan in the US, but you would only do that for patients who are symptomatic. So I'm afraid at the moment, there is no known screening tool. There's a lot of screening studies and, uh, and lab work going on. There's nothing uh, there at the moment. I think in general, in the, the last conclusion period. is that there should be, we shouldn't be looking for a screening test. We should maybe be looking for something to identify pancreatic cancer developing high-risk individuals. Um, yeah. you know, for example, cystic tumors, patients with familial uh, history of, of cancers, um, chronic pancreatitis, et cetera. But yeah, there's no screening test. I, I think last, you're right. I think identifying the patients early is, is going to be the key more than a screening test. Uh, the last question is obviously when somebody presents with obstructive jaundice and you do a CT scan and there's a possibility of pancreatic cancer on the CT scan, uh, do you go for histology or do you just go for fast track? And which ones are the one you will want to do an EUS before taking the fast track? So if, if you look at the NICE guidelines, they pretty much say that if there is a mass in the head of pancreas, you treat it as a cancer, you do not need tissue diagnosis for it. I think if you have a discussion in MDT and the radiologist tells you it looks like a cancer, you look at it and you think it looks like a cancer, you do not need to get tissue diagnosis. I think the problem is when you're not sure, is there a tumor there? It's so small. Is it all inflammation? Is there a tumor there? Only then. So I think if you have any doubts, yes, you'd go for tissue diagnosis. But if there's, there's no doubt, or even if it's 50-50, we would go for resection fast, right? Because we do know that out of every 100 pancreatic cancers we do, about three will turn back as benign, no matter what you do. Uh, but we also know that out of people who don't have tissue diagnosis, 90 plus percent, 95 percent plus are going to be cancers here without tissue diagnosis. So you don't need a definite tissue diagnosis to do a, a resection surgery. And do you have to look for any pancreatic or biliary duct dilatation? Well, there was a talk about previously that if somebody comes with, uh, with a tumor in the head of pancreas or perimbulary region and they have one or two duct dilatation, you absolutely do not need any tissue diagnosis. But if there's a tumor or a mass in the pancreas and one duct dilatation and pancreatic duct is not dilated, then you should consider EUS. Is this something you uh, practice? Or? I think that's, that's, that's really something that you discuss in MDT and look, because you, know, you could have an unseen tumor. Uh, and unseen a tumor could only cause one dilatation. They may not, you know, yeah. uh, so I think you've got to look, if you've got a big mass in unseen it, uh, irrespective of duct dilatation, I think it's the location of the tumor, isn't it? That's, that's causing that. So, um, I, I mean, I'm sure you guys have met people who you think, oh, this patient has a distal cholangiocarcinoma. You look at, and you, you get the histology and you say, it's a PDAC. And you're like, okay, you know, it looked like a, a, a distal cholangio. So I, I, I think, that's, that's a tricky one. I think double duct dilatation, we know it's, it's pretty much gold standard. So I think a single duct dilatation, uh, depending on where the location is, if there's a mass growth, you know, uh, it's an MDT thing. I, I, I wouldn't say that a definite mass with single duct dilatation means that you need tissue. No, that's not correct. Uh, but I think it really depends on the data. That's why you have an MDT uh, with radiologists and yourselves to make that decision. Excellent. 
And just going back to what we were talking about before, I, I think it's quite interesting the, the debate between neuroadjuvant and fast track surgery. Hannah Twin, what do you think? What do you think about this as an oncologist? What do you think about? She has, uh, a, she has sorry, sorry, she has a full talk next time. Ah, uh, is it? So she's a presenter next time. Bridge, are you asking an oncologist? Oh, you are then. Can, can, <laughs> can I say something quickly about the the question about metastases and things? Um, so all I would add to that is that um, we know pancreatic cancers have got a really complex local environment that causes a lot of issues with early metastases and also with difficulties getting chemotherapy into the cells, which makes them very difficult on both levels, really. And I think I just add that to what Deep said about why they metastasize so early. There's a lot of microenvironment issues, um, which are too complicated for me to explain, but it makes it makes them metastasize early and makes um, chemotherapy penetrance really difficult. I think with regards to fast track surgery, I'd like to see some long-term outcomes. You know, if, if we're saying we can get patients to surgery quicker, try, provided they don't get any complications, they get out of hospital in one piece and they get to adjuvant therapy quicker, then do they have better long term survival than those patients having neuroadjuvant and then surgery? Uh, so, I think, oh, sorry, go on. Sorry, I was just going to say, I think for me, the time to get into adjuvant therapy is really key. Um, because not only do I think it's important to be able to remove that tumour, but if we think there's such a high risk of micro-metastatic disease, the chemotherapy is also such an important part of their pathway. How quickly would you start adjuvant chemotherapy? If, if someone had a Whipple and, you know, they didn't have any complications, they got home, they're eating and drinking, how quickly would you start them on, on say, adjuvant fulcurinol? So the difficulty I find at the moment is the pathway of them getting through and out and better. So with lots of less complex surgeries, um, we start them six weeks afterwards, but it's getting them well enough, quickly enough. That's the key. And I think that's why this next talk is really important, because with, you know, colon resections and simpler surgery, six weeks is the earliest really. But I think, you, I think you've got to take it in that uh, that. It's, there's no doubt that if you fast track without preoperative drainage, biliary drainage, your risk of complication is like is less. Of that, there is no doubt. So the chances of a patient getting to chemo on a fast track pathway, without doubt, if the complications are lower, are going to be higher than uh, than on a regular pathway. But most of the, a lot of those complications are related to the biliary drainage. In, I mean, in the New England Journal paper, so you could argue that you know, um, there's drainage related complications and not so much surgery related complications. So I think there's a group of people that go into surgery, do really well, poorly after and never reach chemotherapy and then never had multimodal treatment. Whereas if you give them neoadjuvant, but potentially Hannah will again talk about it the next time, at least they will have had some multimodal treatment if they had some treatment beforehand. Um, but again, you know, again, and maybe in that time of neoadjuvant, but that Hopefully Trish can tell us a little bit about that. They could uh, get a little bit of rehabilitation as well. So that deers, it will, this, that will um, cut on both sides, that sort. Okay, great. Should, should we move on to the next talk? Uh, Trish? Are you, we can't hear you, Trish. I know. Ah. I'm unmuted. Okay. So I'm trying to share my screen. Oh, it says you, I'm not allowed to. <laughs> Try again. It says host disabled attendee screen sharing. I'm the co-host. Sorry, I made you a co-host. I've done it again. I think it was timed out. Right. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Can everybody see that? There should be some elephants. Yep. Great. Yep. Lovely. Right, I'll get going and I'll try and uh, keep to time as much as possible so we can have a, a you know, it, it, you know, there are so many great areas that we need to be looking at in pancreatic cancer, but I'm going to start. So for those of you that don't know me, my name is Trish Duncan and I work in Cardiff. Um, and for those of you that are uh, maybe not from the UK or even those of you that are, uh, that is in Wales, which is a small green area on the map. It is a proud Celtic nation and I'm from the other proud one of the other proud Celtic nations I'm actually from Scotland that's a picture of Cardiff Bay Wales is famous for rugby beautiful coastline poetry amazing singing and choirs and castles in abundance should anyone want to visit um, and this is also the University Hospital of Wales where I'm based and as a disclaimer 
I am the Prehabilitation and ERAS lead for the surgical department in my hospital, just so you know. Okay, so what does that mean? So the, I'm just going to go back through the concept of prehabilitation, a little bit of history, some evidence, and just a little bit of a debate at the end quickly, because, uh, you know, as you've already discussed, there, there's different groups in pancreatic cancer and some strong beliefs and some, you know, lots of great areas. So prehabilitation is the process on the continuum of, cancer, of care that occurs between the time of cancer diagnosis and the beginning of acute treatment, whichever that is. And it includes physical, psychological assessments to establish a baseline function level, identify any impairments and provide targeted interventions uh, that can influence patient's health and reduce the incidence and severity of current and future impairments. It's a bit of a mouthful, but there we go. The concept of prehabilitation has been around probably, well, it was a lot longer than I thought, to be honest with you. So the first paper that I could find referencing the concept of prehabilitation is actually from the British Journal of Medicine in 1946. And this is from the army. So the army were desperate to get more recruits, but the, um, there was, they weren't able to recruit because there was the, the poor general development of the men that were uh, trying to get into the army. And this was caused by, obviously, this is coming uh, throughout the Second World War, but malnutrition, uh, lack of sanitation, poverty, uh, poor and poor education, and lack of opportunity. So the army designed a prehabilitation program, and it was probably the first multimodal prehabilitation program of its day, um, because it included nutritious food, uh, sanitary lodgings, uh, controlled uh, physical training, uh, and also a general education. So they recruited 12,000 men that were considered substandard military recruits. And they had an 85% compliance, 85% uh, of, of the, the men completed the program and had both physical training, intelligence testing improved within two months. So, you know, obviously it's a very different group of uh, patients and we're, we're people that we're talking about because these were young, healthy men, but you know, we've had 75 years to think about the concept of prehabilitation. Um, in 2005, sorry, next slide. In 2005, this paper came out, and I think everyone will be familiar with this graph. Um, and just for those of you that are not, it's basically um, op looking at optimizing functional exercise capacity, uh, particularly in the elderly population, and a theoretical model of surgical prehabilitation. So the purple line, which is A, is your average patient and undergoing surgery and following surgery, they experience a reduction in their functional status postoperatively. And this is followed by a recovery period and then back to baseline. The lime green line at the bottom is what happens if that patient suffers a complication and that puts at risk a slower or incomplete recovery, uh, threatening their ability to get back to baseline or a normal independence. And then the blue line at the top is what happens if you try and implement a pre-operative pre prehabilitation strategy. So you get that patient better and fitter um, so that they can uh, recover faster and get back to baseline or an improved baseline uh, after surgery. And even if you look at the yellow line, if, they, if that group of patients gets complications, that it might safeguard them long term from the point of view of their functional status and possibly their independence. And I think all of us that are um, working in the post-pandemic era in surgery, I mean, if we were looking at the acuity of our patients coming through, they're definitely more, over the last year, they've become more deconditioned, they're presenting later, they're presenting more deconditioned with their symptoms and more advanced cancers and possibly more symptoms. Um, so I don't think that there has ever been as good a time to be looking at prehabilitation really closely and what it might bring to our patients. Okay, so let's look at the evidence and oh boy, is this hard. So. Uh, very quickly, I've just taken three systematic reviews, and as you'll see, um, they're not, uh, some of them are not actual meta-analysis, and I've started with this because actually just getting some data about major abdominal surgery, never mind before we go into HPB or pancreatic cancer, is quite hard. Happily for me, my, uh, some of our UK colleagues had a look at this, uh, and they did a systematic review and meta-analysis in 2019, and here's the highlights. So 15 RCTs of major abdominal surgery, but if you look, um, it also does include vascular surgery, particularly aneurysm surgery. There's two or three aneurysm surgery trials. 
um, uh, abdominal surgery, some benign surgery, so the bariatric surgery, and um, you'll see there's at least two for liver. So not a lot of information for us about HPV surgery. Um, looking at this in total, there's 457 patients that have prehabilitation, 450 controls. Only two of the trials uh, include patients with neoadjuvant therapy. Um, and again, just to highlight, there's very little HPV here for us. Um, and here are the protocols. And you'll start to see the beginnings of the problems is that there is, although the, this is mostly looking at uh, excess, targeted exercise um, programs for these patients, um, the length of the programs is on average two to four weeks. But if you look at everything else, um, there's just a huge um, homogeneity. Um, how many sessions, the length of the sessions, the type of exercise. Um, and one of the interesting things is that compliance wasn't specifically recorded. In fact, a couple of things is a daily diary was kept by the patient or there's weekly evaluation of adherence. Um, so there's no standardization. So it's really hard to look at this data and make sense of it uh, or try and find a, a protocol. Um, what it did show when they looked at these is that they looked at overall morbidity and pulm pulmonary specific morbidity. And they could do that with nine papers um, from, the, from the whole group of the RCTs. And it did show that there was some overall decrease in morbidity in the prehab group that was significant. And more compelling actually was a decreased pulmonary morbidity um, that was more statistically significant. Um, sorry, I'll just go back. Eight studies, I haven't put this on a slide, but they all, eight of the studies looked at length of stay and none showed a significant reduction in length of stay. Um, and the summary from that review was that you can reduce overall and pulmonary complications in abdominal surgery, and it could be uh, prehabilitation could be used routinely, but that we don't have precise protocols and that we need to do the work to look at tailoring optimal prehabilitation protocols for specific types of surgery. So has anyone looked at that? Happily for me, yes. Um, and so this is a Dutch paper, and I'm really going to touch on it briefly because I think I've just put it up here just to summarize how difficult it is for us to get information and to get the evidence based for prehabilitation for our patients. Um, but this is from the De Wolf et al group, and I'm sure most of you are familiar with the Maastricht group. And so they're looking specifically at hepatopancreatic biliary surgery in a systematic review. And once they had excluded everything, we're down to four RCTs. Um, and then they've got three cohort studies and then actually they were, because they were so uh, trying really hard to get some information uh, about ongoing research and just to, I think, to buffer up the information that they were getting from the published studies. Um, they actually contacted the authors of uh, some of these conference abstracts to find out what was going on. Um, so that just shows how little we have to back up our evidence for um, HPV surgery. And I, I'm just putting this slide, it was a terrible slide and I apologize for it, but it's just to, to demonstrate how muddy the data is and happily for you, I'm gonna move on from this slide and, and just summarize what they found. So out of those studies, three studies reported improved physical, physical fitness before and after prehabilitation. There was major heterogeneity in the outcome measures. So three of those studies, one looked at CPET testing, one looked at six minute watt test and one looked at muscle to fat ratio. And those three did demonstrate statistical significant improvement with prehab, but they couldn't really uh, demonstrate that significantly when they looked at complication rates. And because the studies are, uh, you, you can't do a true, they couldn't perform a true meta-analysis like that, but in a pooled analysis study, only one study demonstrated a significant length of stay reduction in the prehab group. There we go. Um, so their conclusion was that there was strong evidence for the beneficial effect of, uh, that, that we lack, sorry, a strong evidence for the beneficial effect of prehab in out, for outcomes in HPV surgery. Um, but there does seem to be a trend towards less complications and shorter hospital stays. And on to pancreas. And this is, you know, from last year, thanks to my uh, colleagues in Newcastle who did a systematic review. But let's just look at how little data we've got. Um, so six studies in total, 193 patients, 
three of the studies, patients were having neoadjuvant chemo and then resection, and three studies upfront resection only. And um, so here are the studies. I'll let you have a little look. There's four RCTs, one case series, uh, sorry, one RCT, four cohort studies, and one case series. And the studies are four from the USA, one is from Spain, and one is from Japan. Um, and you've got really limited numbers, you've got single sites, um, and a real, uh, as you'll see in my next slide, a real um, mix of interventions. So bearing in mind that we're looking at pancreatic cancer, if we have a look at the studies, um, and I'll tell you what they were looking for. Two of the studies were looking about uh, for impact of prehab on postoperative outcomes only. Uh, two studies were looking at improvements in fitness and gaining muscle mass. One study was looking at the relationship between exercise, adherence, and quality of life preoperatively, so not postoperatively. And one study was just to look um, at changes in tumor vasculature. Um, with an exercise program. And what really, when I was uh, reviewing these papers, what really, um, you know, bugged me was that only two of the studies have a nutritional intervention. Um, you know, you're talking about prehabilitation as multimodal, multimodal therapy in pancreatic cancer, and we're not giving these patients nutritional therapy. Um, I, you know, I think we need to do the work, and I'll come back to that. Um, and I'm not going to say much about this slide, which is look at only two of the papers were reporting uh, post-op complications, Nakajima et al. Uh, and Ausania et al. Um, and they didn't find any significant difference in the prehab group versus the non-prehab group. Small numbers, obviously. And they also reported on length of stay. Um, the Nakajima group were reporting did report an improvement in length of stay, but I'm sure most of my pancreatic surgery colleagues will be raising an eyebrow because their uh, length of stay decreased from 30 to 23 days. Um, so that's really difficult. How am I doing here with time? So where does the evidence leave us? And this is onto the, the probably the controversial bit and uh, my views and it'd be interesting to see what the panel is. I'm not sure that this evidence matches so much or the fact that we lack the, the strong evidence base um, and because we haven't done the work. So onto my more probably controversial bit. So this is pancreatic cancer in the UK. Uh, this is uh, data from uh, uh, Pancreatic Cancer UK, 10,000 cases a year in the UK, very high mortality rates. And despite all the work, despite everything that uh, is going on with research and around the world, our five-year, our long-term survival is abysmal. And it, it is getting a little bit better, but I think we'll all agree that it's creeping very slowly. So it's still very depressing for us in HPV surgery and, uh, as you know, devastating for the patients. But pancreatic cancer, um, you know, this is how our patients present. They present with jaundice, malnutrition, uh, high rates of sarcopenia, they've got poor cardiopulmonary reserve, um, and they're really deconditioned. And so they often present in really not great shape. Um, and frailty as well is something that we're seeing in our patients. So it feels to me intuitive that a prehabilitation and optimization strategy is going to help patients with pancreatic cancer. It's going to help more patients get to surgery, get to uh, some kind of chemotherapy um, and it may for those patients who are not um, able to have any treatment or are declining uh, oncological treatment who want best supportive care could lead to better palliation and better quality of life so I don't think it's just about the surgery so in summary this is my feelings and uh, like I said my gut feelings that we need to do the work so I don't think we should withhold giving patients prehabilitation I think we need a multimodal strategy for prehabilitation being the key to success. We need to find the right prescription of prehab to improve our outcomes. I'm not sure RCTs are really the way forward and our groups need to report the results from their prehab programs so we can really start to tailor them for improved outcomes for our patients. Um, we want to get our patients fit for treatment, chemo, surgery, both. We want better quality of life for them during and after treatment. And we need to do the work and advocate for our patients. In Cardiff, just so you know, uh, I, I 
we finally, after quite a lot of hard work, been successful in getting funding for three quarters of a million recurring funds a year for a prehabilitation team. And that is what we're going to do out with an RCT. We're going to collect our data and we're going to share and we're going to adapt our programs uh, to what seems to be working for our patients. That's the end of my talk. <laughs> Thanks, Trish. Um, that was a great talk. Um, with pancreatic cancer, as you highlighted, we've got a sarcopenic population and they're increasingly elderly. So if you, and obviously prehab and ERAS is a suite of interventions, but if you had to pick yourself the most important intervention in prehab and the most important intervention in ERAS, accepting that we know it's multimodal, what would you say be the most important to, to implement? Um, I, I, you know, that's a, that's a really tough question because you know, the evidence isn't there. We don't know. Um, however, my gut feeling from, you know, managing our patients is that um, nutrition is really, really important. And if you're trying to also get them to surgery, I think nutrition, uh, nutritional input for the dietitians, uh, a program to improve their weight, um, manage the malabsorption. I know that recently we've had uh, the great outcomes um, uh, sorry, published about uh, the use of um, pancreatic uh, supplements and how we work that into an exercise program for these really deconditioned patients. That's going to be the challenge. And when to give it is also the challenge. But I think dietetics is massively important in pancreatic cancer. Uh, I couldn't agree more with you that on that. And I think with this, this, with this week, with Pancreatic Cancer UK releasing their national um, programme about um, implementation of um, pancreatic enzyme replacement, because although we saw some really good practice nationally, there was certainly some poor practice as well, especially for unresectable cancer patients. And although we're all surgeons, the majority of our patients actually have unresectable disease. Um, so I think it's really important that we, that we optimise the, the care and the treatment of those patients as well. We've got some questions on the group, uh, on the chat group, uh, Trish. Uh, the prehab in pancreatic cancer studies all seem to focus on surgery and surgical outcomes. Treatment for pancreatic cancer includes both surgery and chemotherapy. Do you think the addition of prehab will improve the rates of adjuvant chemotherapy, which is currently estimated at 50%? That's from Declan in. I see, I see Declan there. I, nearly, I wasn't, didn't realize he was in the audience, so I was out of reference because his um, prehab paper on uh, for liver. Uh, was one of the ones that we looked at. Um, yes, I do. I, I think the number of patients that were, I mean, I have to look at the, the data around the UK, but I think the number of patients that actually get to uh, either palliative chemotherapy or some kind of adjuvant chemotherapy is probably a lot lower than it should be. And I think there will be a role for prehab there. And I, while I totally, uh, under, uh, you know, I've looked at the, the Birmingham data from listening to Deep Talk as well, you know, and my understanding of the Deep Talk, I think there are other groups, uh, both in the UK and worldwide, that we're really looking at ne um, neoadjuvant chemotherapy and, you know, neoadjuvant chemotherapy to guide us as to which are the patients who've got better tumor biology. And we're looking at, you know, implementing prehabilitation before, during, and after, you know, after treatment, potentially with chemotherapy. So I think there is definitely going to be a role for it. And like I said, I don't think waiting for RCTs is the thing. I think we get, need to get on and deliver it and adapt it. And then we will, you know, over the next few years, have an understanding of what's going to work. I completely agree. I think that the, uh, this concept of perhaps continuing prehabilitation into adjuvant therapy, if you're going for adjuvant or having it during near adjuvant, then it makes sense, doesn't it, to support the patient either way uh, so they can complete their, their, their multimodal therapy. Um, there's another question. It says fast track versus prehabilitation. How do we balance the time constraints? I guess that's more um, for, well, go, sorry. Oh, I think maybe uh, Deep can have a look at that. Um, you know, obviously, I, you know, most units, uh, I'll tell you about my, my local unit in, uh, we work together with Swansea, my pancreatic colleagues. They're really, I mean, not even withstanding the pressures of the last year with COVID, but trying to get patients, you know, if you're a tertiary, so we're the tertiary centre for the whole of Southwest Wales. And like most units, you're, you know, tertiary centre accepting patients from quite far away sometimes trying to get them from the local hospital to your tertiary center uh, 
uh, unstented or without somebody having intervened despite great efforts can be hard. So um, I, I think it's really difficult and I can't answer that question at the minute, but I think we will find you know, we will find where it fits in and how it works. So it's not to disadvantage patients that are suitable for fast track. Um, but then there's Deep a question. Has stopped on that. Yeah, no. Deep, I, you say something? I think you, I think you're absolutely right. It's it's just that um, we we've got a prehab uh, a program in in Leicester. Uh, it's been running for just about nine months. Uh, well, twelve months. But because uh, it was three months before the pandemic and then it's kind of uh, restarted about three months ago. So at the moment from HPV, we're only enrolling uh, liver patients. It makes sense, uh, but not pancreas, uh, just because the time gap between sometimes ad uh, near adjuvant chemo, liver resection, adjuvant chemo, uh, you know, they have their uh, prehab during chemo. Uh, but for pancreatic cancer, at the moment, we, we aren't enrolling them in, the, in, in a prehab uh, uh, program at the moment. Um, and ju it's just because uh, there are delays as it is, and, and it, we just feel, and the patients actually feel, that they want to get to surgery sooner rather than later. If they're Would you consider putting the ones that are not so fit or borderline fit through a prehab program? See what happens. I, I think if... I think it definitely makes sense because sometimes we have patients in hospital, uh, you know, on TPN or NG feed, and we've actually had patients go down to the prehab area uh, to do a bit of, you know, exercising uh, kind of physio, which it works. But like you said, I think it's it's not suitable for everyone. But as you know, a lot of the patients are elderly. It's a disease of 70s, 80s. Some of them are quite unwell, cachectic, so it, it can be tricky. But I think if we have young patients, uh, then definitely. Yeah. That actually brings us on to the next question from Jam Jawad, is how do you assess the patient's fitness before and after prehab? See, does, CPAX does CPEX have any role to play for objective assessment, especially in frail patients? Do you guys use CPEX? Yeah, we do. Um, one of our uh, uh, anaesthetists, Richard Davies, has published a lot of work on CPEX assessment. Uh, and the, the extra things that it brings. So it's not just, it's not just about the anaerobic threshold. Um, and actually, I mean, it, it's, having the, it's having the capacity to, you know, that's where RCTs come in handy, is having the capacity to test pre and post and see what the difference is and then correlate that with outcomes. I don't think you can just do one. Um, and I mean, I, I like cardiopulmonary exercise testing. I think it gives me a lot more information about my patients. It allows me to help uh, co-risk assess with my anaesthetic team um, how this patient's going to do and you know I'm sure like most uh, most of us at work in parts of the UK with you know bad social deprivation my patients are not fit and bouncing around with 80s of 12 13 you know uh, I think our uh, I think nine is how they are and they're often you know got significant comorbidities as well so I think just some kind of um, fitness assessment some kind of standardization you know within uh, your unit uh, is the way to go forward. It doesn't have to be CPEX, it just has to be standardized. So you have something to compare. It's all, it all comes together, doesn't it, really? It comes with an exercise uh, you know, program, all the work that's been done in pancreatic cancer on the sarcopenia about optimizing nutrition prior to surgery or during chemotherapy. And all, if we can assess pre and post any intervention to make sure our patients are fit enough for surgery and chemotherapy, then we should be able to get better survival. And that comes on to science question. Is, is length of stay the right outcome to look at? Should we be looking at the long term? And if prehab can influence the five-year survival? L length of stay is one of these things that is, there's so many variables. It's, you know, when is the patient actually fit to go home? And when can the patient actually go home because of other issues? Especially when we are, uh, you know, uh, dealing with patients with difficult social circumstances or lack of family support. I think length of stay can be um, a marker, um, but it, it's difficult. I think we do have to look at our complication rates and we do have to look at long-term outcomes. And I've got a 
a, me a message from Declan. I think there, there is evidence outside of HPV cancers that the frailer patients, the most deconditioned patients are the ones that benefit the most from this. And again, you know, being an HPV surgeon, a, a great amount of our work is actually palliative. A, a big chunk of our patients are not for surgery for various reasons because they've got metastatic disease. So I think we have to look at it in a more holistic manner about how we are going to improve their quality of life. How are we going to give them the best supportive care and where prehabilitation stands in that? It's difficult because you know, campaigning, you know, I've had to campaign really hard for funding for prehab for cancer patients that are having surgery, how we then manage to expand that so that it actually reaches other patients where it may affect their quality of life. It's hard. There's hard work ahead. I think length of stay is a very good question because, you know, I do robotic surgery and, and I tend to send patients home early. It always rem reminds me uh, of a quotation uh, by one of my trainers, Mr. Mr. Diamond in Belfast. He used to say that for pancreatic cancer, you do not look at the outcome on the clock or on the ward chart. You look at the outcome on the calendar. If you have done good service pre-operatively, operatively, and post-operatively, they will live on for years. Otherwise, they will be uh, not, not very well in a few months' time. Does anyone have any other questions? How are we doing for time? We could... I think we're, we're just five minutes over. So if no one has any other questions, I think we'll probably wrap up the session. Um, just like to say thank you to Trish Dungan and Deep Mamde for their fantastic talks, the audience, um, all the panelists, my co moderator Siobhan. And thank you for everyone for attending this Types webinar today. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Thanks, everyone. Good night.